All right, so rather than fixing a row and looking across the row, what I want to do is fix a, a diagonal, fix <coughs> and, and look down the diagonal. So let this be the fractional part of x. And now, rather than looking at n2 z mod n, let's scale everything by n. So divide everything by n, so that's now between 0 and 1, and take the fractional part of that. So these, these things are, we have the same information in this versus this. It's, it's sort of the same operator. We haven't lost anything. And it turns out, one nice thing, is that for m greater than or equal to 1, this thing is actually a periodic function of n. So it's even nicer. And one way to see that is just by rewriting this as this. Right, then our denominator here is always m, so there's only finitely many things here, and it's, that's not too hard to show that it's periodic. So, so we get periodic diagonals by doing this. Right, and here's the first sort of result. Uh, for m a prime, the fractional part of n choose p divided by n is either 0 if p doesn't divide n, or 1 over p if p does divide n. So I'm using this little delta as sort of an indicator. Um, so here's, here's another way of writing it. Right, so, so at least for prime m, it's, it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's not too hard to see what happens. So now I've, I've sheared the whole thing, so now what we're doing is sort of looking down the columns of this picture and, and for the prime. So here's two, you can see you know, off, on, off, on, off, on, and then three, it's, it's off, off, on, off, off, on, etc. So, so the primes are, are, are easy to understand. All right, so what about non-primes? So what the sort of natural thing to do is look at prime powers first. Um, I don't want to do that because this is more interesting. So we're starting to look directly at composites. So what if m is 2p twice a prime? So here's the conjecture. In this case, the fractional part of this quantity is this thing, which is pretty nice. So again, it's, we, don't, we include this term if p divides n, and we, we don't include it if, if p doesn't divide n. But then sometimes we have to add a 1 half. And this is where things get interesting. So, so cracking down exactly where we have to add, add this 1 half is, is not so straightforward. So here, here is what this statement exceptional is. So these are, these are the exceptional residues uh, where, we have to, where we have to add this one half. Um, and this is, this is, the, this is what, what I formulated. This is the sort of the simplest way I have of writing this right now. Uh, I don't want to, don't pay too, too, too much to this um, because what I want to exactly point out is, is sort of what this, what this really means. So this is the same expression from the previous slide. Um, so what we have here, so let me, let me back up just a second. So if n is an, is an exceptional value, if n is congruent to this thing modulo the power of 2 uh, for some j in this range. All right, so for each j between 0 and, and this thing, uh, we get an exceptional value. And so, so I want to talk about just briefly what, what this is actually meaning. Uh, it's very close to the powers of 2p and j. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, so, so this m, m i are the, are the bits of, of 2p and here's, here's j. Uh, this doesn't look at all like the product of 2p and j, um, but I want to you know, do a very basic sort of you know, high school multiplication <coughs> example. So if p is 1, 197 and j is 27, then this is the, this is the product of 2p and j. And of course, you know, for, each, for each one here, we get a copy of, of j here and then we add them all up and, and that's, our, that's our value. So that would be the product. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't the product. Uh, something sort of twisted. This floor basically is cutting off some of the digits in some of these, in some of these sort of instances of J. So, so the, you know, I, I don't have a more natural sort of way of writing this. Uh, it's still a conjecture. This may not be the most natural way of, of writing it, but this is sort of, this is vastly sim simplified from the original version I discovered it. Uh, and this is just sort of where the, where the state, uh, the state of the, the conjecture is. Thanks. Did you try anything with the trinomial coefficients, module 3, 
No, no. There's yeah. So there's there's so much. Yeah, there are, there are lots of generalizations of binomial coefficients. You can look at multi-dimensional, you know, trinomial coefficients, multi multinomial coefficients. You can look at other cellular automata that do all sorts of things. There's lots of ways to generalize, and and I think there's plenty of, of, of stuff within binomial coefficients to keep us busy. But yeah, I haven't ventured far outside of binomial coefficients yet. But yeah, it's a good it's a good thought. Any other questions? In his talk. Yeah, oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't know what the direct connection is. The red uh, triangles there, and, and now yours is Sierpinski triangle. So it's both those topics are coming to dynamical systems, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, the question is that it's actually um, dynamical systems are never ending systems, and they have infinitely many details, right? Mm -hmm. So in your case, is that possible that? Uh, that Sapinski triangle uh, two-dimensional can be extended to three-dimensional or something, or yeah, there are, there are analogs. Like Christmas tree, Wolf's Christmas tree can be extended to three-dimensional. Right. Yeah. There, there are lots of analogs and, and generalizations of of this that I haven't had time to look at. Yeah. But do you know that that uh, that unites your theories here with real life because everything in life is practical. <laughs> 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 Thank you. them together and say some things about how they relate. So there's a little more information at that address. The deadline is September 1st. Yeah.